So hello everybody and thank you for joining me for this week's Object Talk. My name is Emma and I'm an Engagement Officer at the Jewish Museum London. This week's Object Talk is the first of our January Object Talks and will be led by our volunteer Tony. Now Tony has volunteered at the museum for five years. During that time he supported our school workshops, welcomed visitors to the galleries and delivered spotlight skills on the objects he's chosen to talk about today. Now our theme for January is hope and as we approach Holocaust Memorial Day we are looking at ways people found hope, individuals who brought hope to others and times when hope was lost. Tony I will now hand over to you to tell us more about the objects that you have chosen to talk about. Okay, thank you Emma for that very kind introduction. My talk today focuses on an extraordinary voyage. So extraordinary that it was made into a Hollywood film in 1976 called The Voyage of the Damned. Although the film is partly fictitious, it nevertheless shows several of the key events that took place before and during the voyage. Now, in the history gallery of the Jewish Museum, there is a pull-out drawer about this voyage, and it contains three items, a document, a breakfast menu, and a photograph of a couple, George and Taya Moses, on board this ship, the St. Louis. But behind these relatively small items lies a much bigger picture. The story of the St. Louis, a cruise liner that became a refugee ship. To give some context to this, by May 1939, the escape route for German Jews had become increasingly narrow. Kristallnacht in November 1938 meant that for the vast majority of German Jews, there was no future for them inside the country. So when the Hamburg America line, with the direct authorization of the Reich Propaganda Ministry, advertised a cruise from Hamburg to Cuba, over 900, mostly German Jews, applied for tickets. Their aim was to get to Cuba, where they would wait for their visa applications for entry to America to be accepted, and wait there for however long it might take. What was clear, though, was that none of this was going to be straightforward. Now, in order to get to Cuba on the St. Louis, each passenger had to apply for and purchase a landing permit that was issued by the Cuban Ministry for Immigration and signed by the minister himself, Manuel Benitez Gonzalez. The visas cost $150 per passenger, a considerable amount at that time. Now, the document that you can see here is signed by him and was issued to George and Taylor Moses, who came from Breslau. It was then in Germany, now it is in Poland. George was born in 1905 and Taya a year later in 1906. Now, although it looks like a visa, it isn't. Written in Spanish, it's nothing more than a tourist landing permit. It states that they cannot take up work or residence on Cuba or become a financial burden on the state. What it does not indicate is that Gonzalez pocketed every dollar from all of the passengers not just those on the St. Louis, but on other ships that were carrying refugees that berthed in Cuba. It's estimated that he made up to half a million dollars at the time. And it went straight into his personal bank account. Cuban politics and corruption was rife. A few of the passengers had only just been released from Dachau, whilst others had used up whatever funds they'd managed to scrape together, either through property or business sales, or had their tickets purchased by friends or relatives abroad. The day before departure, passengers started arriving, a mixture of relief and hope that a new life could begin and that it could only be better than anything that they had experienced since 1933. Passengers were divided into tourist and first class cabins. This boarding pass issued to Dr. Walter Weisler shows that he was booked in at tourist level. Now, the man chosen to navigate the St. Louis to Cuba was Gustav Schroeder. He was experienced, thoroughly professional 
and definitely not a member of the Nazi party. He was determined that the passengers should be treated with courtesy and respect, just as much as all passengers on his previous voyages had been. Before leaving Hamburg, he called a meeting of the crew and told them in no uncertain terms that if they could not do this, they should leave the ship and they would be replaced. None of the crew left. Unknown to Schroeder though, was that the advert, the Nazi counter intelligence service had placed 12 crew members on board. One of them, Otto Scheindick, was tasked with picking up documents detailing US submarine designs when the ship got to Havana. Passengers weren't allowed to take any hard cash with them. They could only take the equivalent of $4 ship money meant to make small purchases on board. A week before departure, the Cuban president, Federico Laredo Brew, who by now had found out what his minister for immigration had been getting up to, issued a decree revoking all the landing permits that had been issued. The St. Louis should never have left Hamburg. Although this information was conveyed to the managers back in Hamburg, they decided not to inform Schroeder and told him to sail to Havana. They were certain that the Cuban president would not want to cause an international crisis and upset Cuban-German relations. They were convinced that he would allow the passengers to disembark. The St. Louis left Hamburg as scheduled on May the 13th with, I believe, 938 passengers on board, all Jewish, bar one. Now, for the first two weeks of the voyage, it was very much in keeping with cruises of the time. It was still the golden age of cruising. Now, the menus that you can see on this slide offer a variety of dishes, both on the breakfast menu shown on the right and the menu for the main meal of the day on the left. The breakfast menu included porridge, stewed plums, different varieties of bread, wheat cake with maple syrup, fried fresh herring, semolina pudding, salted and fried potatoes, cooked sausage and fried and scrambled eggs. The dinner menu was equally extensive. There was a swimming pool, dances were held and the passenger lounges turned into temporary synagogues on Friday nights and Saturday. Schroeder even ordered portraits of Hitler to be removed whilst services were taking place. He was clearly making a statement about respecting the dignity of the passengers, even at considerable personal risk. Now, this photo of George and Tia Moses clearly shows no signs of anxiety or distress. They would have been totally unaware at this stage of the voyage of the drama that was to unfold. This is just one of many family photos that were taken on board in the first two weeks. On May the 27th, the St. Louis arrived at Havana, but instead of docking at the allocated pier, the Cuban president refused to allow the ship entry. Instead, he demanded $500 per passenger for them to be allowed off the ship. But he knew the passengers didn't have that sort of money. But when the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, the charity known for short as the joint, offered to deposit the full amount with the authorization of the Chase National Bank. And you can see this, hopefully, from the letter uh, on the slide in the last paragraph. The Cuban president raised his demands to $650 per passenger, at which point negotiations broke off. The joint quite simply refused to be blackmailed. Now here you can see the St. Louis in the harbour at Havana surrounded by a number of small vessels. The ship remained there for 10 days whilst negotiations were taking place. Only 20 passengers who'd already been granted entry visas to America were allowed off the ship. But the mood amongst the passengers now changed dramatically. They could not understand why they were not allowed to disembark. Expectations had changed so much that there was even talk that suicide was being contemplated by some who were by now in total despair. Some of the smaller vessels that we can see here close to the St. Louis had relatives of those on board 
and were trying to pass messages of support to them, whilst other vessels were there to pick up any passengers who might jump overboard. In despair, the passengers sent telegrams to President Roosevelt and his wife Eleanor, pleading for the USA to show her humanity and allow them entry. They got no reply. Roosevelt was running for a third term and wasn't about to commit political suicide. The effects of the New Deal had more or less run out of steam. Unemployment was running at 17.5%. Congress was largely anti-Semitic, as were large swathes of the population who were also very firmly against any more immigration. By now, the world's press had latched onto the story and was largely sympathetic. This press cutting from the New York Times on June the 2nd shows that there were real concerns that many amongst the passengers were indeed contemplating suicide and that this might move Roosevelt to allow the ship entry. It also shows that the Hamburg America line was on the verge of ordering the St. Louis back to Germany. Now this cartoon was published in the New York Daily Mirror on June 6, the day the St. Louis was ordered out of Cuban territorial waters, alongside an editorial titled Ashamed. I think it speaks for itself and believe resonates even more so today. We're so accustomed to seeing tragic images and negative attitudes being shown towards refugees, fleeing war and persecution. Passengers were by now fearful that their final destination would be to the concentration camps back in Germany. The German press was gleeful that they could demonstrate that no one wanted to take the Jews in. Now at this point Schroeder decided to stay to Florida, believing that the pressure this would put on Roosevelt would be enough to allow the ship into America. He sailed close to Miami and the passengers seeing the twinkling lights of the luxury hotels on the seafront were convinced more than ever that this was going to be where they were going to live one day. Roosevelt though held fast and continued to refuse entry or even allow for the ship to take on fresh food and water. The mood amongst the passengers was by now one of almost unimaginable fear and despair. Schroeder sailed up and down the Florida coastline for a week, hoping for a change of heart, but also looking for another country to come to his aid. Canada was seen as a distinct possibility, but the Prime Minister, Mackenzie King, wrote in his diary, there are already too many Jews in my Ottawa neighbourhood, amongst other anti-Semitic entries he made. The ship was ordered back to Germany, but Schroeder, was faced with an unlikely mutiny from some of the younger and more politically active passengers. And he assured them he had no intention of returning the ship to Germany. Instead, he told them he was prepared to run the ship aground off the south coast of England at Beachy Head and even set it on fire. The passengers would have to be rescued by the British Navy and once on land, they would be able to claim refugee status. Meanwhile, that same American Jewish charity, the Joint, sent out one of their lawyers who'd been based in Paris, Morris Troper, to negotiate with Britain, France, Belgium and Holland for the safe release of the passengers. The terms were the same that had originally been offered to Cuba, $500 per passenger. Now Troper was successful, although initially Britain argued that the ship should be returned to Germany and any applications for asylum would be dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis. One can only imagine what the outcome of that would have been. Troper used a degree of deception in his negotiations, but finally on June the 17th, after five weeks at sea, the St. Louis docked at Antwerp. Schroeder, who in many respects was the real hero of this saga, wrote a letter of thanks to Maurice Troper that you can see on this slide. It's in impeccable English and is a real measure of the humanity of the man throughout the voyage. Britain agreed to take in 288 passengers, France 224, Belgium 214 and Holland 181. George and Taylor Moses anglicised their name to Moss and survived the war. <laughs> 
in England. When the Nazis invaded Western Europe, they rounded up all the Jews that they could find with German passports who had been on the St. Louis. Out of the 937 Jewish passengers who left Hamburg on May the 13th, 254 were murdered in Auschwitz or Sobibor. Of the 288 who were given refuge in Britain, all but one survived the war. Apologies have since been made by the State Department in the USA, and in May 2018, Justin Trudeau apologised publicly for Mackenzie King's refusal to allow the ship to enter Canada and grant asylum. Now, I believe that there are fewer than 20 of the original passengers who are still alive now. On board was a six-year-old boy, Gert Fritz Grunstein. It's shown here cheekily sticking out his tongue, his friend, Fred, standing next to him. Gert was on the St. Louis with his father, Heinz. Gert's mother had died when he was only five, and he was brought up mainly by his grandparents. Several years ago, when I was chairman of my local synagogue in North London, a sprightly gentleman joined one of our Shabbat services for the first time. We got talking and he introduced himself as Gerald Granston. And gradually, he became more involved in synagogue affairs and became my vice chairman. Gerald Granston was none other than Gert Fritz Grunstein, the boy with the sticky out tongue. And perhaps by an even more incredible coincidence, he'd been lodging with a family in North Manchester in the early 1950s just three doors away in the same street that I was growing up in. And this is Gerald uh, being interviewed by the BBC. He's also been interviewed by the Jewish Museum as well, and for many years travelled extensively, giving talks about his experiences on the St. Louis and his life in Germany. In 2017, he was awarded the British Empire Medal for services to Holocaust education. And in this final slide, Gerald is seen accompanied by his wife when we, as chair and vice chair, were invited to the inauguration of the current chief rabbi. I know that Gerald has always been grateful for being allowed to settle in England when so many of those on the St. Louis had lost their lives. As for Gustav Schroeder, he was awarded the German Order of Merit after the war, and in 1993 was posthumously recognised as righteous amongst the Gentiles at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, whereas a plaque and a tree planted in his memory. So that concludes my talk. Thank you for listening and watching, and I'll hand you back to Emma. Thank you so much, Tony, for such a great object talk. The voyage of the St. Louis is such an important subject to keep talking about, and it's really powerful to hear of your personal connection with one of the passengers on board that ship. Thank you, everybody, so much for watching and joining us for today's object talk. Do please join us again next week, where our talk will be led by another of our wonderful volunteers. We will see you there.